Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Structure and Function of the Parkinson's Disease-Associated Protein, LARC2. I'm Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar sponsored by Gibco, part of Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information, please visit www.thermofisher.com forward slash protein expression. Before we start, there are a few instructions. We want to hear from you during this presentation, so please ask questions or leave us a comment. Answer is welcome too. You can do this by hitting the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and typing your questions and comments. We'll try to get to as many as we can and we'll follow up if we don't have time today. Want a better look? You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you can't hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button at the top right or use the Q&A button. We'll make sure we try to resolve any issues. Now let's get right to today's presenter. We are proud to welcome Quinn Hong, PhD. Dr. Hong is an assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the Indiana University School of Medicine. His area of study is structural biology of neurodegenerative disease and structure-based drug design. He leads a team focused on understanding the mechanism of Parkinson's disease by studying the structure and function of disease-associated proteins. Dr. Hong received his PhD and BS from McMaster University. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Hong. Thank you, Julie, for the uh, thorough uh, introduction. So this is my first presentation at uh, Protein Expression World, and I didn't quite know what was expected of me. So I thought I would start by um, telling you why I feel that I'm old. I'm 42, by the way. So so people in my lab knows that I, I like to listen to loud music in my office. And, and quite often, they would stand outside my office and use a little iPhone app to determine what song I was listening to. And one time I was listening to um, Les Zeppelin, I think it was Stairway to Heaven. And then she looked at the song and she said, oh, that's a classic. So that's why I feel old. But it, in fact, the point is that we are all getting old, right? And the whole world population is getting old. So over the course of recorded human history, the age distribution looks like this. It's like a pyramid where there are many young people and very, very few old people at the top, 80 or older. So, but today we have a big bulk of people in the middle here, and I should point out that I'm, I'm right here. And so I, in my previous presentations, I used to say that we have a bulk of young and productive people, but then one time there was a gentleman in the front, he put his hand up and he said, Quinn, you make me feel old and unproductive. So now I just say that I want to point out that there's a bulk of young and handsome people in the middle here. So no one has complained since. But what I want to point out is that there's a lot of young and working people supporting a small but, but growing but still small population of older people. And that the birth rate has been steadily decreasing. So even today, we are uh, talking about problems associated with age associated diseases and social security issues and all that kind of stuff. Now, in 40 years, I will be here. And my children will be right here. Both of my children will be in this range. So if we have problems in here, imagine what's going to happen in 40 years. So this is not a prediction, but it is a projection because I am existing and my children are existing and they will be here and I will be here. So um, the graph that looks very scary because we actually don't know how to deal with the um, aging population and diseases associated with it, and let alone economic problems. So you know, I, I give this presentation once in a while to medical students at the medical school here, and most of them, as you can imagine, are active, healthy, and somewhat feeling invincible, and I show them this to tell them that even superheroes can escape. 
the effect of time. So they, they, they should pay attention to it. And what, we, what my lab is interested in is the degeneration behind the skull that you cannot see, which is the degeneration of the brain. And we are interested in the process of degeneration of the brain in general, but we study um, processes that accelerate brain degeneration. And, and those are diseases um, known as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So these are the two most common neurodegenerative diseases. So as I mentioned earlier, they have two children and they are expected to live longer than 90. It's getting more and more common that people are living longer. So if you look at, let's say, let's say that over the older than 95 years old, and you can see that about 50% of people over the age of 95 will have Alzheimer's disease. So that's between two, um, between my children, one of them will have it. And if we combine that with the um, prevalence of Parkinson and ALS and other neurogenic diseases, chances are there will be a lot of people with neurodegenerative diseases, um, either Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS, um, also known as Lou Gehrig disease, frontal temporal dementia, and all that. So, so we want to um, understand how neurodegeneration occur, and with the hope that, uh, with the understanding, we can develop drugs to um, slow it down or, or, or prevent it from occurring. And we have been focusing on Parkinson's disease um, simply because we feel that it's an easier disease to understand compared to Alzheimer's, even though more people suffer from Alzheimer's. And so Parkinson's disease, um, you probably have heard about the disease because um, there's a few famous people who had the disease. Um, some are no longer with us and some are still living. But the disease itself caused uh, um, about about a million people in the U.S. and about 60, 50, or 60,000 people um, uh, are diagnosed each year of ha uh, having Parkinson's disease. And these numbers are increasing because we are living longer. So I, I just want to point out here that um, most of the cases are known as um, sporadic cases, and Strike simply means that we don't know what caused the disease. And there's a small number, um, I think it might be up to 10% now, that are known as familial forms of Parkinson's disease, which um, are caused by uh, genetic mutations that are passed down from one generation to the next. And the genetics form is the one that we are focusing on to understand the mechanisms of disease because we know specific mutations in specific Species mutations in specific genes that we can study. So, so Parkinson's disease is probably as old as, as people. You know, it, it it has always been there, but the disease was first um, described by James Parkinson about 200 years ago um, in London, and in, in this assay that uh, he called um, uh, the sick, the disease was known at the time as the chicken palsy. And, and in there, he described all the clinical features that are now used to diagnose the disease. So you can see in the background that I put here, involuntary tremors of the extremities, like the hands, feet, and neck sometimes. And, and people tend to walk with a stoop posture. And when they walk, they shuffle their feet in small rapid steps, known as shuffling gates. And you know some people have difficulty getting up from a seated position. And there are other uh, motor-related uh, symptoms that you can see. Um, so because of the uh, motor um, features, um, the disease is commonly known as a motor disease. Uh, but in fact, it is very much a neurological disease. So on the left-hand side um, slide, um, what I shown here, what I show here is a, um, a PET scan. Um, that highlights the part of the brain here, highlighted in red and yellow. And that part of the brain is called the substantia nigra, whose job is to produce dopamine um, for, for the whole brain. And so by the time a patient is diagnosed with a disease, you can see that 
about, I would say that about 50 to 70 percent of cells in the Sartania Niagara are already dead. There, there's, there's a wide range. Some people say maybe 40, 50, 60, 70. But uh, suffice to say that, that upon diagnosis, the disease itself or the pathological effect that occur in the brain is quite advanced. And it will de continue to degenerate over time. And then it will, it will spread out to other parts of the brain and the patient would eventually die. So, but if you look at the neurons, remaining neurons um, in, the, in the brain of the patient, you can see here that this is a cell body, a neuron. And this is unusual protein aggregate, almost like a spherical protein with a halo around it. And this aggregate is uh, known as Lewy bodies, named after a German scientist who first described it, uh, Frederick Lewy. So, so this spherical thing is, um, is abnormal, and, and its presence is uh, the final uh, diagnosis for Parkinson's disease. So if we, take, if we take this aggregate out and look at what is in there, then we will see it consists mostly of a protein uh, known as uh, alpha synuclein. So, so later on, it was discovered that there are a number of different point mutations in this gene um, also causes um, um, familial form of Parkinson's disease. So these are all the genes that have been associated with familial Parkinson's disease. So the, the, the one highlighted in orange here, including Parkinson, are the ones that my lab is working on. But today I will talk to you about what we have done, some of what we have done with the protein called LUT2, or leucine rich repeat kinase 2. So LUT2 is a, is a large protein. Uh, consisting of um, 2,527 residues. And it consists of multiple domains, at least seven of them. Um, there might be some other things up here that we're not clear uh, what they might look like. But these are, dom these are different domains that I have put in as homology models because we don't really know the true structures there. But based on the amino acid sequence, uh, we predict that this is what they would look like. So it consists of um, two enzymatic uh, domain or two um, biochemically active domains. And one is the called the kinase domain. And, and a, um, another domain called the GDPH domain, uh, but it's called ROC, um, RAS or complex protein domain. And and this protein is very attractive to, to um, pharmaceuticals because uh, mutation in this gene um, is found in a large number of people um, affected with Parkinson's disease uh, in certain populations. For example, in uh, North American Arabs, it could affect about 30% or so of, um, of um, Parkinson's patients. So it represents a large number of people. And another attractive feature for pharmaceutical is that this is an enzyme, and enzyme consists of active sites into which we could design compounds on inhibitors to fit in and thereby inhibit its activity. And this is a really exciting target simply because uh, some data have suggested that overactivation of the kinase activity um, is, uh, is associated with the cause of Parkinson's disease. So the hope is that because overactivation causes disease, then if we can design inhibitor to inhibit the active site of this enzyme, knocking down this kinase activity might have some therapeutic value. And, and it's a logical way to think about it. And we also, my lab have worked on this at the, um, early on, and, and we found that um, inhibitors that inhibit the active site of this kinase domain also inhibit other kinases, so, so we give up uh, working on this domain. And many, many um, pharmaceutical companies continue working on this, and they have since developed a number of very potent and very selective compounds. But so far, they have been, um, uh, they have not been uh, shown to be useful as, a, as, as, as drugs yet. 
So instead of focusing on the kinase domain, um, what we decided to do um, was to focus on the GD base domain. And oh, let me see if I can have the thing back. So we decided to focus on the GD base domain because um, based on the arrangement of the domains, we uh, hypothesized that activity of the GD base domain on the rough domain regulates the activity of the kinase domain. So the idea is that if we can modulate the regulator of kinase activity, then we might have a chance of finding unique and specific inhibitors or modulators of kinase activity of the two. So that was the, the rationale behind our focus on the rough domain. So by the time we get to it, um, there are already two structures determined for the rough domain. One was done by um, uh, Jun Hang Deng, I, which, whom I knew for a long time. He's, he's at the um, uh, University of Oklahoma. And this, for this domain, uh, you can see that it's a domain swap structure. You can see one green part here, and a part of it had fallen apart and attached with the yellow uh, part over here. And likewise, a, a, a fraction of the structure is, of the yellow structure is falling apart and interact uh, with the um, uh, green domain here. And this kind of structure in structural biology is usually referred to as domain swap structures. And in this model, based on this model, Jun Heng suggests that the interaction between the yellow domain and the green domain um, is critical for its activity and function. And mutations that causes destabilization of this, this interaction might be responsible for disease pathogenesis. But the idea here is that this protein is functional only as a dimer. There was another structure very shortly after that from, uh, from my group, uh, Gotha et al. from Wittenhofer's lab at, uh, in, in Germany. And they have determined the structure of an ophelop, of bacteria ophelop, and they suggest that, um, in fact, dimerization doesn't occur through domain swapping, but rather it occurs through the core-core interactions of an adjacent domain. And by doing so, it would bring two rock domains uh, close proximity to each other, which then uh, could potentially contribute a lysine residue from one domain to the next, to the other, and what we normally refer to as um, arginine finger, and, and that would constitute an active enzyme. And again, here the idea is that the functional unit of rock is a dimer, and def therefore monomer, um, monomeric form is predicted to be inactive based on these two models. So as a structural biologist, we love to look at structures and we would compare them and see what cause, what's responsible for the differences between the two structures. So the blue one here is the domain structure by Jun Peng Peng that I, I showed earlier. And you can see here that, that the, the C terminus of this um, construct is very far from its N terminus. So the distance here is about 30 angstroms or so. But for the bacteria um, uh, orthodox structure, you can see that the N and C termini, terminus are close to each other. So that, this is commonly found in proteins where the N and C terminus are, are, are interacting closely with each other. So we thought, you know, what could cause this difference? And when we look at closely at this, um, the two terminus, we see that in the bacteria structure, there are, um, a big patch of what we call hydrophobic residues that form like a greasy patch. And, and usually greasy patch in protein tends to interact very strongly because of hydrophobic effects. So we thought that maybe this grease patch serve as a glue to stabilize uh, the N and C terminus together and preventing it from falling apart as we see with the human structure. So then we look at the human uh, sequence and see whether such a greasy patch can also occur. And, and this is our homology model of the human uh, 
protein based on the bacteria protein. And we can see that in the human's protein, um, there could also be a grease patch um, that could potentially stabilize the N and C termini, just like it occurred in the bacterial structure. However, in my friend Jun Peng's structure, what he did was he made the construct um, starting, ending there and starting um, here, uh, which effectively cut off this grease ball or glue ball that could potentially stabilize the structure in that way, and thereby allowing the ends to unfold away from each other. So that's our model from looking at the structure. And to test that, we made a construct that would consist of, um, of the, the, the grease patch here as well. So we made a construct that is longer um, uh, than um, what was determined before. So to see whether um, it's, it, it has any difference compared to the previously determined structure, and immediately after um, purification, and even during purification, uh, we did see differences. So the first thing we saw was that um, this protein eluded um, as two peaks, um, based on the size estimate from the size exclusion column, it appears to be a, a species around 24 kD and another one at about 48 kD. And just by looking at this, we can say that um, uh, this is a monomer species, and that is a dimer. So we have a monomer and dimer. Then we did SDS page, Western blotting, uh, um, multi-angle light scattering coupled to size exclusion, as well as mass spec to show that they are indeed monomer and dimer forms of the same construct that we made. So because um, uh, we have monomer and dimer, we want to see whether the dimer can be, the dimer could be um, broken up into a monomeric form. And by adding nucleotide, and we indeed do see that the dimer get broken up into the monomeric form. And again, we, we test it to see whether any confirmation changes um, uh, that could occur using size exclusion and light scattering. And so, so based on these data that we, I presented so far, it is uh, clear that it does form dimers as well, from, and 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 does also form monomers. So, um, so since we have the monomeric form, we want to test whether um, the monomeric form has activity. And um, as I showed earlier, that both previous models suggest that it needs to be dimer to be active. So we use a number of different assays, and this is um, this assay on the left is is actually direct measurements of uh, GDP generation from GTP using HPLC coupled to mass spectrometry. So this is the actual production of GDP, GDP. So we know that it's active for sure, and then we use a, a calorimetric based assay to determine the kinetic uh, activity of the protein. So we can see that it is indeed active, but it's very low, comparable to um, other GDPases, small GDPases. So, um, so the, the, the unusual thing that we saw here um, was that the KM is unusually high, and, and sometimes KM can be um, interpreted or can be um, viewed as a uh, substrate affinity or affinity for substrate, but in this case, it doesn't look like it represents that. So we want to determine the actual affinity for GTP to the enzyme, and it turned out to be about um, seven to nine micromolar. And we use this as a, this was determined with a fluorescent uh, polarization-based assay, which contained a dodipi. And so in order to make sure that the dodipi itself doesn't bind to our protein, we did a competition assay where GTP was effectively completely complete off the uh, GTP BODP. So this suggests that uh, all the binding that occurred was through GTP. So once we have all that established that is active, um, the, we determine the affinity for a substrate, then we compare the uh, activity difference between wild type and the disease associated mutation. And you can see here that uh, the wild protein 
is more active than the disease associated mutation. And that was interesting. So we went ahead and determined the actual kinetic parameters as well. So you can see that it's less active and the KM is lower, which suggests it might bind to the substrate more tightly. So to determine that, we, we actually, let's see here. Hmm. So I, I guess first what we did was to see um, whether there was any structural perturbation that could occur by this mutation um, by using CD spectrometry. And you can see here that um, the disease associated mutation and wild type basically have the same um, structural profile on, C on based on CD. And there's no changes when GDP or GDP is added to it either. So there wasn't any structural changes that we could observe with uh, CD spectrometry. Then we, also, then we look at the binding affinity for the substrate. Uh, basically what we're looking for is to understand um, what caused the reduction in activity um, of the disease associated mutated protein. And as you can see here that uh, in terms of GDP affinity, the wild type and the mutant has pretty much the same. Uh, so they bind to GDP with the same or very similar affinity. Whereas for GTP, uh, the disease associated mutation seems to bind about two times more tightly to GTP than the wild type. And of course, you know, because the differences are so small, we use a, a, an orthogonal method. This is a, um, um, a um, thermofluor assay used to measure protein stability. It can also be used for um, affinity for, for, for ligands. And you can see here again that for GDP, um, the y type and the mutant have similar um, affinity or, or the effect on the melt curve is the same, whereas for GTP, the disease or so mutation bind more tightly and therefore more stable. So it does seem that the effect that we saw, even though small, uh, is probably true. So based on all that, our model uh, for the, our working model for the protein um, is that the rock domain is just like any other GDPase is, is a, a molecular switch that um, when it's bound to GTP, it turns itself to the on state and it, it by itself autonomously or by itself would slowly hydrolyze GTP into GDP and effectively turns itself off. But in the disease associated mutation, the mutation that causes Parkinson's disease, um, this hydrolysis process is um, uh, decreased. And at the same time, it also increases affinity for GTP. And with the two combined effects, uh, what it effectively does is that it locked this enzyme in a persistently on state. And potentially that then activate the kinase um, activity. So that's our, our working model. So based on this, is there anything that we can do to develop drugs from this? And as a structural biologist, the first thing we do is when we determine the structure. So this is a structure, an X-ray structure that we determine um, at 1.7, 1.8 angstrom. And <clears throat> so what we see here is that uh, the disease associated mutation and this arginine 1441 here um, potentially forms a hydrogen bond with this um, carbonyl, backbone carbonyl group. And that backbone carbonyl group belongs to a structure um, that is known as a switch two region of GDBases. And the flexibility um, of this region um, or its mobility uh, can regulate the GBase activity of the whole enzyme. So our hypothesis then is that when a mutation occur that could disrupt this hydrogen bond here, then um, that would then increase the, uh, decrease the stability of this switch two region and thereby decrease its activity. So that's our hypothesis. So if our hypothesis is correct, then if we can design something that can strengthen this interaction even in, even in the absence of the arginine in the case of disease mutation, that could mitigate or stabilize um, the switch two region and restore its activity. So that was our hope. 
So how do we do that? How do we test our hypothesis whether we can we can stabilize this with two region uh, um, of the block domain and and store its restore its activity? So to design a drug based on structure, uh, it's necessary to determine where you want to bind the drug to. And, and what we do is we look for pockets on a protein surface. Now that looks like little caves that you can see here, um, you know, that in order to fit the, the, the drug compound that we docked on here. And we determine that uh, by using what a technique that we call solvent mapping. Basically, we probe the whole surface of the protein to find deep pockets into which we can sit, we can fit chemicals that could be potential um, drug target. So this is what we found. And the biggest pocket that we found, um, luckily, happens to be um, adjacent to the disease-associated mutation. So, um, so we went ahead and designed a series of compounds um, and we, that would fit, potentially fit into this pocket to um, modulate the activity of the rock domain of LUP2. And we found a number of compounds, some upregulate the activity and some downregulate the activity. So now we have a way to modulate the GD base activity within the tube. And the next step is to test whether uh, upregulation and downregulation of GDPH activity would affect kinase activity as we proposed earlier. And if it does, or if they do, then we might have a way to regulate kinase activity without touching the kinase domain itself. So in order to test for that, uh, we need a lot of full-length protein uh, to determine um, the activity. So this has been a problem in the field for a long time, um, um, associated with uh, purifying full-length LUP2, you know, because it's such a big protein, it's very difficult to make. And the, the best way to make it um, before was to overexpress it in HEX293 cells. And, and this is um, what we see when we express it in HEX293 T cells. And this is just a Western to show that the protein is indeed LUP2. And we have spent a lot of time purifying this. And I think LifeTech or now Thermo Fisher is selling protein expressed from, from 293 cells. Uh, but as a X-ray crystallographer, we need a lot of protein, so we look for other systems that could express a higher level of protein in order for us to measure activity and as well as determine its structure. And we have been using um, a new product from uh, Thermo Fisher called the XB293 cells, and this is what um, we get. Um, we get significantly more protein and is equally pure. And again, it's Western to show that it is indeed full length of two. So the first thing we did was to test whether the proteins produced by the two system um, have similar activity and indeed they do. Um, so the, the XB, um, the protein purified from the XB cells seem to have high activity, but I don't think that is statistically um, significant. So I, I would conclude that they have similar activities. And this is kinase activity. So, so, so based on um, what we have done so far, this is the difference between the two cell lines. Um, in terms of cost, um, the, the XP cells tend to cost us a little bit more um, because of the media uh, that we use costs more than, than the traditional media that we use for 293 cells. But in terms of time saving, it, we save a lot of time and protein yield is, is almost 10 times. So, we're quite happy with the XP system, and this is a system that we have been using to produce protein for our research. And we have some results, but they're not ready to be um, uh, presented yet. So I have a, a lot of people to mention, to uh, give credit to. These are the people who um, were responsible for producing the results that I just talked about. And then I have two people that I want to blame for me uh, presenting this this presentation um, is um, Mark Ferrici and Kurt uh, Vogel. Uh, so I have I've known Mark for a very long time, and uh, I tried to look up a formal 
uh, executive looking picture of him to put here, but this is the most serious picture that I could find of him. And, and of course, these, these two guys, I consider them to be friends at this point, because I have been working with them for a long time. And of course, I have many collaborators that I couldn't have space to mention, but these are some of the people that I collaborate with. And um, I think that Thermo Fisher asked me to put this up um, at the end, and I think that we are ready for a Q&A session. Thank you. Excellent presentation, Dr. Hong. Thanks for bringing that information to us. So before we get started with all of your questions, here's a quick reminder about how to reach us today. Questions can be sent via the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll get to as many questions as we can. Our first question is, is the kinase domain not a good site to target for drug therapy because of the side effects caused by inhibiting other kinases that exist? concern at first. That's why we gave up on the kinase domain. But so that was our uh, concern at first. Um, that's why we gave up on the kinase domain. Because um, most of the, or and in fact, all the kinase inhibitors that we found that can inhibit um, the kinase activity level 2 also inhibit other kinases. Uh, uh, but that was a premature conclusion on our part because later on, Eli Lilly, um, Merck, and, and GSK, I believe, uh, had found compound that was very specific to LUT2 and, and did not seem to inhibit other kinases. But even with those, um, there were side effects that was um, too severe to, to, to render them a viable drug target. Okay. Did that answer the question? I'm sure you answered it very quite well. Uh, look to is illustrated as a multi-domain protein from N to C terminals. Are these truncated forms or each domain of look to successfully expressed and characterized individually? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. And, uh, and um, we're working on it. Uh, that's what I can say. So the most well-characterized domain is a GDBase domain, as I talked about, um, because it could be expressed uh, solubly and, and stable enough for us to characterize um, structurally as well as biochemically. And other domains um, we are able to express and, 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 and characterize as well, but uh, they're not ready to, uh, to be published or to be presented yet. But they're not easy either. So. So look to appears to be a heavy long chain protein. Is it possible to perform a specific site mutation on this protein? Uh, yes, indeed, that's a good question. So be because of its size, everything about it is difficult. So uh, when, when the first report, um, actually there was two reports that came out uh, in November 20th, um, 2000 and four, I believe. And when I first saw the reports, I said, okay, I'm going to solve this structure in six months. And uh, more than 10 years later, we are still trying. And uh, I have to say that it takes six months just to amplify the genome because it's so big. Uh, but now, now we, as well as others, we have stable construct now that we can use to do site-directed mutagenesis quite effectively. And we have made a lot of different mutations uh, even though the gene is quite big. Okay, we may give people just another moment to submit questions. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I would like to once again thank Dr. Hong for his presentation. Dr. Hong, do you have any final comments for us today?
Okay. Um, it appears that um, we had a small technical difficulty with Dr. Hong. So again, I would like to thank him um, for his presentation. I would also like to thank Gibco, part of Thermo Fisher Scientific, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May 4th, 2017. You'll receive an email from us alerting you when it's available on demand and posted on labroots.com. You are welcome to forward this announcement to any colleagues who weren't able to join in today. Thanks for logging on and participating in today's broadcast. See you next time.